Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So the first part, we I need to tell you a little bit about the intro for the material I'm using. So I'll just read some of this to you. The material that we're going to be reviewing is largely gathered together by a man by the name Mr. T. Y. Lee in a small booklet that is called a life of blessings, colon, the guide to prosperity and happiness. And this was printed um, for the Theravada temples that were in uh, Australia and Singapore. The booklet shows us how to uh, achieve prosperity and happiness in life according to Buddhism. So I'm telling you, Mr. Lee has chosen a very useful practical guidelines for everyday life. This is a little statement that was by Panavara, pa Panyavara Mahatera, who's from the Bodhi Tree Forest Monastery in Australia. Mr. Lee has chosen a very useful and practical guidelines for everyday life to serve as a foundation for growing more wisdom. And this is what we call every man's Dhamma. And I like that because that's what I feel is most important. It stands out for its clarity and simplicity. And it points to the flexibility and the adaptability of Buddhism in the modern era. A life of blessings highlights the practical simplicity of Buddhism in contrast to somewhat dogmatic faith characteristic in many other religions. But for the spread of good Dhamma, such suttas within this booklet are recommended for relevance to the social problems of our time and they're applicable in everyday life in this generation. So we keep that in mind when we go over these pieces. Just one minute, <laughs> have to get the water. You for your I'm going to cover the Buddha's advice concerning the first of six areas that appear in the Sigalavada Sutta. There are six areas of living which all the people would consider while passing through their life. It doesn't matter what religion you are, you have to face these things. And this sutta was the Buddha's guide for peace and happiness for the lay people. And during this series, we're gonna, we are going to go through all six areas in four talks. I said five before, but we can do this in four and during the month of July. So we'll be finished by the end of July. The first part of it is basic morality. And that's today. And then on July 14th, we'll do building and managing wealth. And the third section, protecting assets and wealth. And then the fourth section, that's on July 14th. And then uh, the false friends and true friends, protecting relationships. Those two sections we're going to do on the 21st. And then qualities for success for the end of it for both uh, lay people and leaders in anything in the world. So here's a question for you. If someone came to you to ask you what is Buddhism right now, one quick way to give a glimpse of it would be to draw a picture um, sort of like this. You would say Donna and draw a line and say practicing generosity for helping others by helping others. The second line, you would say sila, and then you would draw another line, and then you would say, this is cultivating the morality by observing the five precepts. That's what the sila is. And then bhavana is 
draw a line again and acquire wisdom through meditation and the wisdom that you are uh, acquiring is how exactly do phenomena come up in our mind and they're there and then they pass away? How does that work? And how does that lead to reactions in life or responding in life? This is, this is what is really important to figure out because we're working towards, in Buddhism, we are working towards ending reactions, reactionary behavior and, and coming out with, um, behavior that is responsive behavior and fruitful for the community, for the country, for everything. So the five precepts, we usually, we talk about a great deal is to abstain, number one, to abstain from killing or harming living beings on purpose. Number two, to abstain from taking what is not freely given to you. Number three, to abstain from sexual misconduct. Number four, to abstain from telling lies, abusive, harsh language, gossiping, or slander. Remember, gossiping is repeating something someone told you about somebody else, but you have no knowledge of whether it's even true or not, and you repeat it and repeat it. And slander is different. Slander has to do with telling someone something against someone else so that you can get an advantage. It's about breaking up groups of people that are working together well. And it's really a bad thing when it's in a company or in a group or community group, it's very damaging to abstain from abusive consumption of drugs and alcohol. That's the fifth one. And the fifth one is a balancing one because with the fifth one is basically telling you if you break this, you have a good chance of breaking the other four, the four precepts. Now the, the sigil of Adi, let's learn a little bit about the background of the Sutta, how it actually happened. The Sigil of Vada Sutta is named after Sigala, who was a young man who lived during the time of the Buddha. And Sigala was very headstrong. He was materialistic and he was stubborn. He always had many excuses for not paying respect to the Buddha. He had excuses for not going to the temple. And the parents of this young man were devotees of the Buddha. But no matter what they did, they could not make him follow in their footsteps. And his father, who was a very wealthy man, he was worried that Sigala would go astray and would just fritter away the fortune of the family that he stood to inherit. So he was concerned. And after a major illness, the father called Sigala to his deathbed to convey his final wishes. And he requested that Sigala worship the six directions to the east, the south, the west, the north, the nadir into the earth, and the zenith up into the firmament every morning. And as this was common religious practice in India at that time, Sigala agreed and was obedient enough to be faithful and sincerely perform this ritual every morning. Now, as had hoped the father that the Buddha came across Sigala one morning as he was worshiping the six directions. And the Buddha then asked Sigala, why? was he doing this? And Sigala replied that he was merely carrying out the dying wishes of his father. Well, of course, the Buddha then proceeded to give a new and more meaningful explanation to this ritual. The explanation formed the basis for the discourse called the Sigalavada Sutta that we're talking about now. And at the end of the discourse, Sigala took refuge in the Buddha and the Dhamma and the Sangha as a devout follower of Buddha Gautama. So now you heard a word in there when I was just re talking about that, and the word was ritual. 
I want to clarify something that when we say that we don't believe in rites and rituals anymore, that's not exactly what the Buddha said. When we get to a Sotapanna level, the person says, I, I can see clearly this, that any rituals I do will not carry me to Nibbana. That's the specification on the statement about ritual. It's very sad sometimes when I see somebody in a family and they decide they want to be Buddhist. Everyone else is of another group. And it's okay to, you know, that do that. But some of the celebrations and everything that are going on, it isn't necessary for you to cut yourself out of the social loop and not ever share these celebrations with someone because what you were saying was, I understand these rituals that we think are going to take us to Nibbana, that's not something that I want to get involved in. But some of the celebrations of groups and communities and such, we should cut ourselves out of the community. And you're going to hear why a little bit now. So number one is the basic morality is the topic. And for harmful reactions to avoid, there's four harmful reactions that we should absolutely avoid. Number one is avoid hurting or killing living beings by not hurting and killing. Each individual protects themselves and others from suffering and harm. In this way, the lives and the safety of the individuals are protected. All sentient living beings, including animals, and not just human beings, want to continue to live. So there is a pain and a vibration that comes, and there's also a feeling of restlessness, guilt, and remorse that happens to us if we kill an animal and then we begin to think about how that was for the animal. So this is all getting in the way of our mindful development when we are working with our meditation and it creeps in. You think it won't, but it can block you. That's because why? Because when we're practicing meditation, we're giving the mind permission to open up and trust us. We are setting up a new form of communication with our brain. And in this communication, we're going to do a lot of things in our development the brain has never seen us do before. We have to understand a little bit about the brain. One of the things the brain does, and this is the mind and the brain is the operating organ that kind of makes these things happen, okay? <laughs> and the problem is that if we don't forgive ourselves for something or we go through, say, a big trauma. Maybe you've had an experience of going through some kind of trauma and you can't remember the whole thing later on. Why does that happen? This is a form, a light form of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a light form of that experience. But you can't remember because the brain is protecting you. I had a friend who flipped in an automobile and it rolled twice and she survived but she couldn't remember that hour or so that was involved with the accident and right afterwards at all for a long time. And she started to get sick from it and she needed to remember it. And under hypnosis, she was taken back to remember it. And she remembered it. Once she remembered it clearly and understand I'm through that, I'm past that, I'm here now, everything began to be all right. So this is interesting how, this is just a subconscious thing that happened for her, but why it happened was because the brain was trying to protect her. She was trying, we reach a time in our meditation, we want to tell our brain, it's okay for me, for instance, to do forgiveness. Yeah, I'm 50. I never forgave anything before in my life, but now I want to do forgiveness. And your brain is there, wait a minute, wait a minute you never did this before what are you doing and it's actually it's concerned for you and you just have to talk with your little brain have a, brain, a little talk with them it's okay for me to do this i'm a big person now i'm grown up i can handle this if something happened with you when you were young something bad that you 
try to put out of your mind, you may need to remember it to release the damage that is stored back here in the back of your top of your neck behind the base at the base of your skull. And it can even cause headaches and things. And this is where you want to release it. So forgive it, let it go. And then once you forgive it, face it, let it go, realize that it's in the past, you get to stay in the present. Number two is the to avoid taking what is not given. By not accepting what is not freely given, where somebody's being forced under duress to give you something. This is how each individual protects others from hardship and loss. In this way, the possessions and the livelihoods of individuals are protected. And this includes property that someone misplaced or they left behind and where, be, where it's possible an effort should be made to return the property to the rightful owner. And this also includes copyrights and intellectual property where counterfeiting and privacy, piracy, I'm sorry, piracy, um, will cause loss to the actual owners of this art or music or dance or film, these sorts of things. And when they make their living to make this art for us to see, and then we cheat and we pirate it to each other and we have counterfeiting. And I actually had a student, he had quite a bit of money, had a whole library of counterfeited classical music. And then after a few months, about six months of practicing, maybe six or seven months, he, he sent me an email and I was shocked because both he and his wife decided we're taking that and simply destroying it. We're just destroying all of it. There's nothing we can do about it. So many people gave us this over the years. We knew it was counterfeited. And he told me that how much they felt relieved by doing that. They felt totally clean in the mind that they had committed themselves to stopping doing this. And they were heavily involved in music and such but they didn't need to do that. And they decided to be more careful because of how they felt about this. So it had a big difference for him in his meditation through the process he went through. Avoiding sexual misconduct is the third one. By not engaging in sexual misconduct, this is how each individual protects other families from pain, suffering, and anguish. And this is how the unity, peace, and well-being of families are protected. And in this way, this good behavior protects all the families in the community. Structurally, this compounds in a community and builds a better place for people to live and grow up. Now, this adultery means being involved with loved ones of others and forcing oneself on someone who is not giving consent. And it includes protecting anyone who is still young and living with their parents. And everybody wants to live in a place like this. Of course you do. The next one is avoid lying. And they say, don't tell lies. And when they say, don't tell lies, it deserves an explanation. And this is what he found also in this by not lying and using other forms of false speech, each individual protects society from mistrust and from disorder. This is how the integrity and the security of the societies are protected. And number four, note is that this includes all forms of false speech and harsh words which cause harm such as libel, slander, gossip, or spreading any forms of rumors about anything. Now there's four underlying reasons for committing harmful actions instead of following wholesome actions. These four causes, number one is desire, number two is anger, number three is ignorance, number four is fear. 
Number one, a desire for example, because of desire for wrongful pleasures, one may engage in sexual misconduct and this lack of control of mind, lack of minding the sense doors. Number two is anger. And for example, because of anger that is not controlled, one may hurt another person. We hear a lot of things happen in the summertime with the heat and the heat gets to a certain level back home in the United States and all of a sudden everybody's fighting with each other. And there's a lot of things for the sheriff to do. We have a small town and all of a sudden he's busy every summer. But this anger is not controlled behavior. This is someone who actually has ignor is ignoring the potential that there could be a different way of handling this. And they don't have enough knowledge about what? They don't have enough knowledge about how anger actually arises from a painful feeling and I don't like it and starts getting stronger because revving up the mind at how I'm angry before and this is like that and then I'm going to just react again. And they don't put together this stuff. It's not taught in schools and it's a shame it's not taught in school because a lot of communities would get a lot calmer if we were teaching in high school, in health class, something about this other part of your body that's above here. <laughs> and if we could teach more about what was going on here, we would actually be helping a lot of what's going on from here down through the body because that is where this all begins. Ignorance, for example, because of ignorance that it is wrong to purchase stolen counterfeit or pirated materials, one may decide to take what is not given, even if it's a gift, and then you know it's pirated or counterfeited, it's something that shouldn't be used and passed around. Fear is the last one, for example, because fear of having a mistake or a misdeed discovered by someone ah, opens the door to doubting where you are, doubting what's happening, and restlessness starts to happen in the body, moving, bouncing the leg. Something is being hidden when a lot of times a person is sitting there tapping their heel on the floor. And then I love that the drug companies came up with a drug that could stop you from doing that. And so now they had to invent a diagnosis and that's how the diagnosis of restless leg came to be. I got that story from the company that ended up making the first one of those drugs and I had to laugh because I knew that was what was happening. I was sure of it. It's been there through my grandmother's history and back through the ages there was always somebody sitting around tapping their leg trying to forget what they said this morning or what they did last night or something else and now we want to try to erase that yeah so anyway this is about uh a misdeed or a mis a mistake being discovered and this is where restlessness and the guilt of it and the remorse, the feeling that all channels through the body and kicks back, not just with headaches or maybe you can't sleep or your sloth and torpor starts happening at school and at work. That's the other part of that. But also any time of the day, this is happening to bother you. Now, a virtuous person will not be led astray by desire, by anger, by ignorance or fear, they will not react based on an assumption without doing something about verifying the truth first and then trying to respond instead. This is the difference. And as such, he or she will avoid these four harmful actions. And so, it is here that the Buddha starts by laying down the foundation for basic morality for everyone. Without exception, there should make, uh, we should make an effort to live by these rules. And he wanted to lay it out clearly and simply that you could remember. And that's why he set up the five precepts.
We should not cause suffering by hurting or killing, by stealing or telling lies or by adultery. It only compounds in the community. How many times in your life have you decided to do something because they did it or she did it or he did it, so why can't I do it? And I always go back to thinking about the little lemmings in France, if that's really true, they get a certain population and then they all go to the cliff and they all jump off and commit suicide. Well, why shouldn't I? Everybody else is. No, we need to go further than that. If we want peace in the world, we need to come down and look at the seriousness of what we need to examine. So we do not wish suffering to come to us in these ways, and thus we should not be the cause of such suffering that would go to others as well. They're talking about the reflection and what you do, well, I'll do it too. Anyone who habitually commits such acts will sooner or later get into trouble. It will fold over on you. And avoiding the misuse of alcohol and drugs and keeping the five precepts is something that all practicing Buddhists try their best to observe. When consuming drugs and alcohol, one's mind becomes cloudy and then it makes it easier for the wrongful decisions that lead to breaking the other four precepts. This is what's going on. It's just a fact. You know, and you can, I remember Bunty telling the story of a man who said, well, I really like that little drink of sake after my meal, but can I have that little tiny little cup of sake after my meal? And Bunty sat there and said, no. Next day, the man came back into another interview I've been thinking, he said, what if I could have just half of a little cup of sake before, I mean, after my meal? And he said, no. And the next day he came back in and asked for a quarter cup and then for his taste on his tongue. And we he gets it, just no, your brain will pick it up. You may have to make a decision. The point is, where are you going? What do you want to do? You can say, okay, it just means heavy consumption. Well, what is light consumption and what is heavy consumption? And when was the last time you sat all wired up with your brain to see where your brain is and at what point it can't make a quick decision? So to save yourself from the endangerment of fight or flight, we suggest that you don't. And see, how, see what happens. Give it a few months and see what happens. On the broader level, each individual actually also helps to protect society by avoiding negative actions. By individuals collectively avoiding these actions, each individual is thus protected by society too. This is where it wraps. It wraps around you and it helps you through the whole community gets involved because they get affected by how well you're happy and living levelly and doing well in your life. And other people want to do that too. So by individuals collectively avoiding these actions, then everyone gets protected by the society. And the Buddha therefore placed such great importance on these foundations of morality. And here lines the basis for the peace and harmony of one's mind and happiness as a byproduct for all individuals in society. That's the end of Mr. Lee's notes. And I put a few things more in here that I want to go through. First, I want to send you to a film uh, that is a 26 minute short film I saw yesterday. It's really, really very interesting. It's called Evolution of the Heart. And this film was put together by a conference from a Mind Life Institute that held their conference in Dharmasala and involved the Dalai Lama as well. So there's a link here for you on the pages. And the film is actually about the synchronicity 
of the development of science in the field of evolutionary biology and cultural evolution. And this science shows us that the quality of people's lives within any country can be measured by their reflection within the community in which they live. The community contributes to what they become. It is a wonderful statement about the progress in the world regarding the evolution of the hearts of mankind. Please listen to this precious film. It's short and it's really great. When you listen to it, I suggest to you that you set the speed at 0.75. It's not really fast, but everybody will understand. And it's really a nice listening speed at 0.75. The controls are there. I tested it. And for me, it was very good this way so that everyone would hear it clearly. And if you wanted to take notes, you could do it easily. And when you listen to it, um, the film presents an experiment that's kind of funny. They did this with two groups of chickens. The students of this professor did an experiment with two different groups of chickens and how many eggs they were laying. And the idea was to discover what would happen if you took the best laying hens and you attempted to breed more chickens that would also lay more eggs the same way they were. They used two groups of chickens located in two different places. And at the end of the first time period in the first group of chickens, they chose the one chicken who laid the most eggs to breed more baby chicks. But when they examined the behavior of this chicken, they noted that it was pushing around all the other chickens to take advantage of getting more food when they were fed and space to lay more often in the laying bins. And the future generation born through that chicken did not result in the chickens that lay more eggs. That was interesting. In the other group experiment, they chose the most successful group of chickens at several groups in different hutches that laid the most eggs. And they found out that the chickens in this group were kinder to each other, shared the food when it was fed, and cooperatively shared the laying boxes. And when these new chicks were reproduced in the next generation, they did lay more eggs and they did have better dispositions too. So it proved to the students that working as a community together with, no, with more cooperation and kindness, it was a better thing in the long run. So strong and happy communities help everyone stay stronger. But still, it's a fact that if someone might show up that thinks differently and when it comes to treatment in their community, we should not forget that if someone is different, people can change. And when someone else shows up, also that is an opportunity for us Buddhists to find out if we really do have equanimity, kindness, and patience. It's time for generosity and patience and kindness and patience again and helping the person to understand what works better in the community. People are capable of real forgiveness. This is something that some people do not believe, but they are capable of forgiving themselves and others. There are many things going on in the world. I don't know if you've all heard of Huponopono, which is the Hawaiian wisdom, which has a kind of community effort where everyone in the community comes to the person who is having so much trouble and the community works together to support that person until they come out the other side in a good frame of mind, having gone through a trauma or some sort of situation, death in the family, breakup, 
children dying, whatever it is. And they help all together. That's a Pono Pono. In Africa, there is another one called Ubuntu. Ubuntu is talked about in the film I'm sending you to, the 26 minute film. But then there's another place that Ubuntu is very famous for at this time. And this is where the terrible genocide happened in Rwanda. And there's a tiny film that is a nine minute film about how human beings can actually forgive each other and go forward. And this was a case for a woman who knew this man who had killed her children and her neighbor's children and butchered them and went to prison. And when they decided as a country, they overturned this one person and then they set up a government where they made a decision that Ubuntu was put into the constitution of the country. In several places, this happened. And South Africa was one, and where Rwanda was is another one. And this case, this shows you the friendship, and she talks about how she did her forgiveness and what she did. And it's an amazing relationship she has with this man now who was the person who murdered everyone around her and she escaped. This one's nine minutes long and it's a very sweet short film. Although I understood the idea of the community contributing to us as we grow up in the film, I detected a hint of desire to make things change. If you listen carefully in the 26 minute piece, you might catch where the scientist, the man says something. It's important for us to remember that what you do in the present moment dictates what happens in the future. The Buddha made clear to us that we cannot change another person. So we can only change ourselves and by the light reflecting from us, others will be affected. And then we can hope that we will ask uh, that they will ask us what we are doing and they will learn. I think about sometimes the six monks who came to Japan to bring uh, Buddhism to Japan. I was taken with Bhante and some other people from the Japanese conference that we used to attend to go there and visit in 2006. And we went to the cliff, there was a big cliff and uh, underneath there's an uh, uh, overhanging and underneath is where they camped. And they simply came, they sat down, they camped with permission on that spot and started to carve the cliff into a huge, beautiful Buddha, into Bodhisattva statues and devas and everything around it with an altar in the front side and they lived under underneath. They simply set up camp and began to carve the statue in the cliffs and no one knew why they were there. No one knew who they were. They did not proselytize to anyone why they were there. But the people started coming and they came at first to ask, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And then things started to change. They brought food for them and then they brought water for them. And then they came around and wanted to know more about who they were and what they were doing and why they were all so happy carving up this big cliff. In this way, when we change, this really affects the world around us. And this follows the plan of the natural law of change. We don't have to make somebody else change or punish them if they're different, but if we put a example in front of them and surround them with that kind of example, they might begin to see the worth of changing. This is one reason why Buddhists are not to proselytize, push others around by teaching the Buddhism. We're always supposed to remember another word. That word is promulgation, promulgate. We make available the teachings instead to proselytize means to press another to agree with you. To promulgate means just to be the light of the teaching and answer questions as they're asked. And we only teach when we are asked to do so. 
And one of the things we are not supposed to do is say, I can't go, we go. Our following the Buddha's advice opens our eyes to more light in our life and changes thoughts and actions. It allows us to contribute to the positive vibrations in the world. And when we can mix with other people, this affects those around us. And eventually they discover how it feels for themselves, the effects of forgiveness, loving kindness, and compassion and joy and more balance comes to the community. So I throw open the floor for you at this time. I actually think I did that in about 45 minutes and want to know what your thoughts are about how the structure works with the precepts in Buddhism. What do you think about it? Pablo, hi. Hello, hello. <laughs> nice to be here. How? Thank you for uh, for the Dhamma talk. So, so I do have a question on idle chatter specifically, because as I understand it, it's not part of the precepts, I'm but it sorry, is. Sorry, Pablo. I just uh, because uh, do you, do you want to kind of uh, we can uh, we wanted to keep it in two parts. So I'll uh, well, stop and we start the. I know we usually did, but I tried to do this in 45 minutes. Let's see what happens if we keep going this time. Okay. 15 yeah. minutes after, we've got about uh, uh, 25, 25 minutes, I think, almost. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll keep going. Okay. Idle chatter. Go ahead and explain again, Pablo. Yeah. Yeah. So, as I understand it, it's not part of the precepts. Um, is it is it something that we should be looking out for just just as like the precepts or I mean is it not as important or okay, or okay. I mean and going even further I don't really know I don't really understand what idle chatter actually is because there's idle always an intention I'll, I'll try to clear it up idle chatter is just nonsense stuff and you just you know you talk 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 okay and there's no no point sometimes. Some people people will do this sometimes when they're upset about something, they'll show up and they'll just talk, 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 talk. Yeah, they keep going, 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 going. But there's no direction. It's not the same thing. Idle chatter is just uh, talking about all of the stories on the street and the gossip and the stuff that's going around and the rumors and feeding off of it. Today, but uh, let me also say idle chatter is much more pressured in amongst monks than it is in the lay people and it isn't described precisely in the precepts except to fall under the spread of gossip and um you know uh what is it gossip and slander and stuff like that floating around you don't grab hold of any of that stuff you kind of smile and walk away or you you know in an office situation i had someone describe an office situation where something happened and they were absolutely certain this woman had done this but no one had any proof of anything and she was immediately the whole the whole place just decided she was guilty this happens in life it's not a pleasant thing you know and um she didn't know what to do you know she was totally marked and tagged and everybody grabbed on it fast like it was people were bored and they were waiting for something to grab onto and they just grabbed onto it and went and went and went you know right now it's like um everything is the fault of the government with covid or something and you want to get really angry you start saying something or grabbing one thing in the united states has so many lies going on and every every side is telling lies and they're playing this ridiculous game but if you're bored you grab a hold of it and take it to the lunchroom and spread it around the whole cafeteria and people are just waiting for something and what you're talking about with idle chatter, your mind, you can feed off of this and then you can't work. It just completely occupies your mind. 
messes up your day. So the Buddha is saying, refrain from a lot of idle chatter that has nothing to do with anything. Now, this isn't the same thing as you and me are working on something and we sit down for lunch and we start firing at each other about how to develop something on a project with off the top of our head. It's not the same thing at all. We're, we're just throwing up ideas with each other like this to come up with one that is really going to work. You know, It's a useless kind of talk is what he's saying. Don't waste your time. The Buddha was big on don't waste your time. <laughs> you know, he was really big on that. You know, he wanted you to look at how much time I wasted. He would say these other years before I became enlightened with almost killing myself and all that he learned from all those things he did, which I keep telling you someday we will do Sutta number 12. If you promise to bring Kleenex and cry and everything else, <laughs> it's just <laughs> terrible when you hear everything that he tried and you think, what was he doing to his body? My gosh, what was he thinking? You know, making himself sick, throwing up and doing the vomitus routine and starving himself and lying on sharp things. And, and then, you know, when you consider you've seen somebody take a fast, right? Okay. But have you ever met somebody that took a fast to the extent that the front of their body could go through with, if you put your hand down, you could touch your backbone by pushing down the front. Only women experience this for a few hours after the baby comes out, before the organs go back. I had a doctor who was a real clown. He says, you wanna feel something? I said, okay, what? He took my hand and went like this and pushed down and I could feel my backbone. I didn't, wasn't Buddhist at the time, but I can tell you, if you're that skinny, you are really stressing every single organ in your body and pushing death at your door, you see? So the, the question, it's just with idle chatter, chatter, it's like you're torturing yourself because it's not, it's, it's keeping you from doing what you normally would be doing, you know, during the day in life. Does that help you? Yeah. Oh, I'm not muted. Yeah, definitely. Okay. definitely. Okay. Thank you. Because some of the things, the place you don't want to get lost is reading where some people are emphasizing things too much for the lay person. And they're actually things that are for the monastic. And not for you if you're in lay life. You have to be careful about that. Some people go way overboard with some things. And you don't have to. You're allowed to pick the string beans. Don't tell your wife or something. You can't pick the string beans in the garden. <laughs> you can. <laughs> but the, the monk can't. And the summonera or the summonary can say there that he can say there they are. And the other person or the, the upasaka or upasika, they have to pull the, the, the vegetables off, but the monk can stand and said, there's one, there's one, but he cannot touch it, take it off the vine. That doesn't mean dad gets to say he's not going to work anymore in the garden. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you see, watch out for extremes. Anybody else? Yeah. Parel. Yeah. Yes. Um, Sister Kema, thank you for today's, uh, it was really lovely. Uh, whatever you speak, every time you speak, I, you know, get get something new to learn. So I really like what you said about Buddhism. You know, if someone asks you, just talk about Dana Shila Bhavana, and you know the way you, it's a, so concisely you put uh, what is Buddhism. And the second thing I wanted to, you know, just uh, speak about is that uh, the movies that you spoke on, like you know these the two links which you were which you are going to give. Uh, for the movies and uh, one of them was that uh, from the mind life institute about the development of the heart and in that you mentioned that uh, they were talking about how um, you know the heart for the development of the heart the culture around which around in which you stay also influences in the development so does this uh, translate into you know the importance of the sangha uh, for us, like, you know, um, the people who are around us, like my family, um, you know, my husband, the people I'm living with, if they follow the precepts and if they are, um, 
you know my, uh, they are like my like they also follow the tenets you know of dana shila bhavana and uh, are always trying to better themselves does that influence me in a positive way like oh, is yeah. that oh yeah sure and Absolutely. is that the reason is that the reason sometimes we feel you know we make friends who are like minded that's right and uh, we tend to lose uh, contacts with people uh, you know on our spiritual journey if you are on a spiritual journey and you reach a certain place and you were very friendly with somebody before and they have not progressed with you so sometimes you sort of tend to leave them behind does that happen in life what happens is the likes the the places you are similar you feed each other and there's a great deal of much of the practices in india that definitely are on the same wavelength a lot of religions are there's a tremendous look i mean when you try to examine what we teach you we are actually teaching you the practice that uh, i believe saint francis of assisi was practicing okay the way that he was practicing. And the reason I say that is the pictures of St. Francis of Assisi in the Catholic faith show, always show him in the garden with all these little animals around him, okay? So one time I went across the stream in, in uh, Missouri and I, this is before I was a nun and Bonte said, take my robe, you can use this old robe, here you can have it. And he gave me this brown robe, not as dark as this, it's the same color as a tree usually. So I went up across the stream and climbed up the side of the mountain and I found this big rock to sit on amongst some trees. And um, I actually sat that time for like two hours. And so I was very, very, very still. And when I opened my eyes, they didn't move at all. I just opened my eyes because I then when I opened my eyes, I started to feel again my body and there were little things in my lap. I just looked down and there was little chipmunks on the, the my robes and the birds were all around me. And all I could think in my mind is don't move. You're just like St. Francis, <laughs> you know? And then I look at that reflect, of course I analyze this because I have analytical. So my reasoning of this whole thing goes like this. Uh, the tree was brown and I am brown. The tree did not move and I did not move. That's all this is. But that's, it was much more than that because I did not have any bad energy coming off of me. See, now I have mm. Sikh friends, you know, and I stay sometimes at their house. And it, it's a wonderful thing to see the men with doing things in the morning. And I stay there before I fly out of the country or something. And when I visit them, it's it's just wonderful to see the, the grandmother, the matriarch of the house taking care of the temple in the center of the house and the love and the devotion and all of these things. And this is not in conflict with anybody. And the love that is in that house and keeping of the precepts abiding with the same system, the Sikhs have 17 rules, you know, that they have to follow. And that those rules are very, very, you know, it's very, there's different divisions of the Sikhs also, but I had a boss once who was a Sikh and I, I dared, I said, can I please ask you a question? Cause I always do. <laughs> and he said, sure. And um, he had his little knife on his, uh, uh, carrying his knife on his little belt, right. the belt when he came to work because it was a holy time. And I asked him, I've always wanted to ask, could you tell me please, what is this about? And one of the 17 rules that always stuck in my mind about this group of Sikhs was the knife is there because if anybody ever threatens your life against your religion, whoever you are, whatever religion you're practicing, I am obligated in my faith to get between you and them and save your life and defend you for anyone taking your religion away. And I'm there like, wow. This is serious stuff. <laughs> and I'm thinking, how can you you think there is a big difference here? Because the the person that goes completely uh, to anatta in Buddhism and looks at no one is different than if somebody crashes a car, you stop your car, you get out, you get the people out of the car before it burns up. Of course you do. Who who would I care if they're in the car? I don't care who they are. I I know exactly what I have to do. You see. 
So why, yeah. what is this, this uh, thing? It's a little bothersome to see, but it's part of the humanity is we have to belong in a group. And if I'm in this group and you're not in that group, then I can't talk right. to you anymore. <laughs> That's silly. And I don't get the difference between pink, yellow, black, brown. Oh, here's a very interesting story about my husband uh, who was a speech and language pathologist working in a high school. And they had a lot of people saying they needed speech and language therapy who didn't. And a lot of them were coming from the, 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 uh, the community of the people of color. And what he thought was, well, okay, we have to review. He became the head of the program and he said, we have to review everybody. But one of the things that stressed him out so bad when he came home one night was he said to me, I, have a, I said, what's going on? He says, I don't know how to handle this. There are two boys with the same problem. I can have a therapist come and work with them three days a week, but they won't sit in the same room. And I said, explain. And the issue was one of them is brown and one of them is black. I said, I beg your pardon? What's going on? And so all of a sudden we found that there was a conflict between two different people of color based on the lightness or darkness of their skin. And I had never heard of anything such as that in my life. I thought there was enough of a problem between you know, just saying white and yellow and <laughs> whatever, you know, I, I couldn't understand any of it growing up. And my parents never, never volunteered any information. So they never slanted me in a bad way, but they didn't straighten me out because I don't think they could figure it out. You know, they just never saw it that way. All they saw were human beings, you see, human beings. Yeah. See, we used to only have one thing we could scream and say, look, we all have blood. We're all in common. And there was the story of the the person who was Caucasian refusing the blood from the person of color. And, he, and the, the doctor just said, fine, then die, because that's the that's the that's the blood that's here. And it's your type of blood. What's going on? Finally, the guy accepts the blood. But now we have another part of our body that is very much the same in all of us and could clear up everything. And it's inside this thing. <laughs> Our brains are not different and they all function in the same areas for the same types of problems, you know, uh, and difficulties that we face. And if we could only get past this, at some point we will. Where the evolutionary line is, I'm not sure, yeah. But when you have things that are the same in a group, you emphasize that and you have a joyful dance <laughs> together. You know, you take a walk and laugh and have play and have a great time because all of the, what the Sikh taught was all in the Christianity. The Christians forget what's in there. I don't think a lot, this is my personal opinion, but I, I wonder if people who... There are good missionaries too, but when there's a bad missionary, I wonder if they ever looked inside and what they're getting angry at on the other side. Because when you start to examine what Christ was teaching, he's in line with so many different things. But that's not what their game is. Their, their, their objective is to find somebody to proselytize to and to convert and say, I have another star in my crown. Unfortunately, they seem to be tainted by an old hymn that was in the 1800s. And it, it went like this, you know, how many stars, many stars in my crown will I have? when I get up to heaven, and it had nothing to do with them and their life. It had to do with how many people they brought in the fold, you see? And bringing in the fold uh, can be a rough deal sometimes in the uh, proselytizing uh, in world, it can be. And it's just, it's, it's inexcusable in some situations. They went across the line and governments asked them to leave countries after the tsunami happened. I will just put it that way. They were asked to go home <laughs> because they said things to survivors that should never have been said. 
So, you know, that sort of thing is just totally unacceptable. And that's not what any of this is about all around town. You see, we should all be looking at our commonalities because we have to look together to the mother or we won't have any place to live. The mother is the earth itself. And we've gone beyond the point where we can pick on each other group by group by group and expect that we can have wholesome survival. We have to go away from that. We have to look at the reality that you can live. What is it? Uh, I think it's um, only three days without water, but I think it's one week without food or something like that. And water is in crisis in this planet. People just don't understand it yet. They think we're going to drink all the ice <laughs> or something. They don't know what they think, but they don't seem to understand. They're already going around all different places in farmland in the United States. They show up and they want to come and check your well and measure your rate of consumption and the water tables try to figure them out. And there's a there's a real line there, you know, and something is testing us in the universe. Something is testing us. I don't know what or, you know, but we we are under we need to get together on what we're doing. That's where I am. Yes. Yeah. So that's what, you, that's what you stress are the good things that you all have in line. Yes. And, you, and you stress that part. And, uh, you know, if you tell me what they are, sometimes I can find them for you. You just tell me what they are. <laughs> if there's a if there's a conflict, just call me and tell me and I'll just write you a note back. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have got some files on that <laughs> over the years. Yeah. Thank you, sister. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah. How'd you do with everything? You are you there? <laughs> yep, I'm uh, I'm here. Thank you, Sister Kevin. That was. Uh... Uh, yeah, it was a really nice, uh, a nice talk. I think uh, uh, relating um, the teaching to the daily life, I think, is uh, increasingly important um, uh, because it gives a um, a different, a different model um, to uh, what's become really a, a very um, uh, established view of, around, for instance, uh, uh, individuality and and individual choice and uh, and these sorts of things but not necessarily individual responsibility right and, uh, and, and i think this is this is a you know an example of of what we're all going to have to face in one form or another uh the impact of our own choices not only for ourselves but uh for everything we we come into contact with even remotely you know, our choices about what we buy or where it's sourced or all the rest of it. Um, and uh, I think Buddhism has um, uh, an impressive legacy of, of teaching, uh, which is very consistent around this. That's good. I really like that. Thank you. That's good. It's, um, it's something that we all have to stay in balance with. And certainly we, uh, it's made it difficult for everyone uh, with COVID because we have been uh, stricken by taking, by taking people away from contact with one another. And um, in this area, I think they felt it in the community, some, especially the older people, you know, because the older people, a lot of them sit outside and they've always been sitting outside to speak to everybody coming by. And all of a sudden, nobody's coming by. <laughs> There's nobody there. And it's very sad to see, um, that they've actually hung together in this colony. You know, we live in different groups here. And so I'm in a colony uh, in section four and different colonies are structured different ways. I was once invited to go into a colony where there were 200 families and that's where you would be. And um, I opted not to do that. It was, seemed like too confining because I felt like I would get in a position where I would never be able to leave, you know, except mm -hmm. to, cater to that group of people but um 
Yeah, it just really affects us all. We can say that now we have another thing in common. We've got our blood, we've got our brain, and we've got COVID. <laughs> we've all had an experience in COVID. We can say universally this affected the whole world in stop what you're doing, turn around, take a look at what's really happening in your families and with your children. And hopefully some people got to iron out some things that were bothering them in this whole situation, but it was pretty nerve wracking for people who lost their jobs suddenly and had to go loose. You know, I, I have to tell you, we were talking about trying to find a car and Shashi and I have talked about it, you know, and trying to figure out how we could do this. We don't know how to do it, but we did go one time to look at cars. And when we were looking at them, I said, where did all these cars come from? I didn't hit home. One of the first things that people did when they lost their jobs was they gave up their cars mm. and they just took them and turned them in and stopped that everything stopped. They lost their cars. So almost all the cars that were over there for sale, like right now, it's still that situation. They're all, uh, you know, they don't know what to do with them because so many of them came back and they just stopped payments on them, you know? So, I don't know what the answer to all of this is, but about the cars, but all these things are heavy duty changes for people. And then the, the trains stopped, you know, they just didn't go. They just stopped moving people. And then I went, last week I went to the doctor um, to, to have him work on my back. You know, I go to an Ayurvedic uh, practitioner to work on my back and getting out of the car, I had not noticed something before where he parks the car and we cross the street to go up in this building. And on the, the highway is like pretty high up there. It's coming down a hill like this and it's gonna turn, so it's tilted. So when I got out, I looked over the edge. I said, do people really live down there below me? So at the level of the highway, when it's tipped this way, the level of this highway is even with their roofs and there's a whole entire community there. So what happened here? Looked like a place where they would have built a condominium in that location. What happened? Well, the immigrants desperately wanted homes and some of them paid as much as 20 lakhs to have a room the size of my bedroom and bathroom and that's it. These little tiny hovels, they must have paid 20 or 30 lakhs for these and they got into them and it's unbelievable, the conditions. And that's the first thing I wanted to do was get food and take it down there and give out food and he said oh don't get emotional we can't do that <laughs> you didn't have your second shot for vaccination and everything you can't do that and it's like some of the monks have been doing and giving out food the whole entire time and I'm caught in this dilemma of I can't move I sound like the wicked witch of the west when she said to uh, Dorothy suddenly in the Wizard of Oz you can't move and she couldn't <laughs> and I don't go out of the house you see I go out and I clean the porch and take care of things on the porch in the front but it's all encased I don't really go out so yeah the difficulties of facing COVID so we all have COVID in common there's another one we have COVID. I think this is really uh, important because I think it's the first certainly example in uh, uh, my lifetime of a, a universal experience that's global. Yeah. That everyone has a common language around and a common experience of. And then of course, we have another one and that's the human condition, which we all have a common experience of and actually a common language about. Um, and that's, uh, again, the, the, the real value I think and, and um, impact that the Buddha's teaching can have uh, because it's a practical description of the human condition and a practical description of yeah. what we are individually capable of doing. Um, right. But yeah. we have to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it's the responsibility that's, that seems to be, as it were, the unattractive part. Well, you know, in some religions, the persuasion is you have to do this or you're going to go to hell. Mm, yes, but and that's the not the case. Frank, the Buddha is more frank about it. Actually, hell, he says, you create every morning 
you create heaven or hell for the day and you're personally responsible for creating your life so i look at buddhism and i say well somebody will say why did you do this because i don't have to die to get to heaven and they'll look at me funny and say what do you mean at which point they'll buy me lunch and i sit down and explain <laughs> It's a, I've done that a number of times in Malaysia, that particular topic is really funny, the effect it has on somebody if you say it, but you mm. think you're out of control, and so you go to the psychologist or the psychiatrist, when actually, if you come to Buddhism, and you learn more about how everything works, you begin to understand that if you keep going with the Buddha, you're going to come out in more control than you ever understood you could be in your life. That's what I figured out about all of this, you see. And um, you still have times when you're going to slip back and forth. You're still going to remember things. But when things come from the past to bite you or you just say you discover new things, the example is you discover new things that you missed when you were young, <laughs> you know, in a structure of family or something, you're trying to help other people. And all of a sudden you come across this. But so if you start to lament, you lament for that long you don't lament you just say oh wow that's part of what was going on. okay fine let's go <laughs> and then you're you're and when you're working another thing that's very clear about uh compassionate service is that when you are working for people helping them to understand this you certainly aren't sitting there uh with sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair about your own stuff because especially this is a good place to be because you're going to see a lot of people having a lot more problems than you ever dreamed you could have in your whole life. And it, they're all basically constructed the same way. The dramas that you run into, you run into with somebody in a very high class, middle class, low class, and the dramas are all identical. That's what's interesting. If you just start doing this for 10, 20 years uh, in any way that you're working with the brain or with analysis if you look carefully nothing's new <laughs> this is just like fashion going around like this and if you keep your mother's knitted skirts to the floor so long eventually they're going to come back in style and the these dramas if you look there's one okay that that's the one that's the one for the person who's wealthy the person in the middle the person who is devastatingly poor doesn't mean matter you know, and the re so the, the Buddha was dealing with this and he made such an effort to present it to them in the similes and ways to remember it and be able to use what he was teaching. He was really, really good at it. Yeah. And that's what we want to try to continue to do. So thank you very much for your comments. And I think. Thank you. <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna close down now because we ran this together. But we will do another one next week. We will do building and managing wealth, and I'm gonna hook the one next to it onto that protecting assets and wealth. The two of those together. So yes, the Buddha said, please get rich, and <laughs> you can under you know please make money and be wealthy and don't be ashamed of it. Some people think if they're Buddhist they have to give everything away. No, you don't do that until you're crazy like me. <laughs> And then you just have a party and you give somebody something that you own until it's all gone. And then you have a ceremony and become a nun. That's what I did the American Indian way. You know, that was what I did because <laughs> I had been exposed to the, to the American Indians with the naming. And when, you know, the woman in Dances with Wolves, her name was uh, Stands with Fist. But that wasn't always her name. <laughs> when she came there, she talks about it, uh, it, him another time in this film, she tells him what her other names were as she went along. There was a little scene where she, they're talking about it. And so this was the idea that you, as you develop, after all, your body's a new body every eight years, right? In, in your cycle of life or something like that. So why do you think you're stuck, you see? You're just shaped differently. <laughs> That's about it, right? So everybody have a happy week. Let's say our prayer and we will come back next time. We'll be talking about part two and part three in next week's uh, building and managing wealth and protecting assets and wealth. Okay.
Men is suffering one day, suffering three, and the fear struck fearlessly. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and navas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.